Summer. Yeah, hang on. <laughs> That's the only reason I stay in Michigan, man. It's an Oberon. Yeah. Yeah, bottled. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, the beer is the reason on, I stay. Yeah, it's better on tap, but well, you know, most things are. We don't have a tap. <laughs> so, why? Why is that? Why don't we have a tap I, in the house? I think we should just replace like the hot water taps with Oberon. I mean, we don't need it in the hot water in the summer. <laughs> right. Just, you know, just flip on the Oberon. <laughs> Come right out of the sink. Have you seen that, that uh, meme? All right, got my, I got my sink fixed. <laughs> it's like dispensing wine. Whew, that was tough. Yeah. It works now. So, uh, I want to talk, um, well, here, we'll do the intro. We'll do the intro. Yeah, uh, intro first. Yeah. That's how we know we've started. <sighs> From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. There we go. So I did want to spend like a little time warming up here before we hit our topics. Yeah. Because I think we need to talk a bit about what kind of a a few weeks it's been. <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting. It's so, been an interesting few weeks. We did our level best to do a Not show a week. last week. And Didn't happen for us. It just wasn't happening. Wasn't One of the reasons be. is that um, it got hot. Like really hot. As surprisingly hot, surprisingly fast. Uh, on Memorial Day, it was 98. Mm-hmm. Day before. 94. We had some, it was 94. We had some guests over. The house was a sauna. Yeah. It was so, god awful. So we we had guests too, and that kind of blew some time. You know, not that we, well, you know, res- not that we regret it, but it ate up some time we might have used. And it was so hot in the family room that um i brought out a salad for nice. dinner yeah and like a Caesar we salad. plunked it on the table and within about 15 minutes it was like a, a puddle of, of wilted slime, slime. <laughs> it's, like, it's like what happened to this stuff don't ask nobody don't wanted ask. to eat it no well, like we all got our first serving in yeah and then it was like Ew. is there more salad and you're like ooh. It's not it, salad anymore. It was like a, a movie where there's a special effect where they show someone hit by an aging ray or something. You know? Yes, yeah, right. It just collapses in on itself. Uh, so oh, that's gross. Yeah, we're also. I think we were still catching up and recovering from from your trip. Very to, much. I get this is the first day. Yeah. yeah. That I felt back. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so that was like two weeks ago. Two weeks. That's what it takes for me to recover from yeah. like a, a stressful road trip. And yeah, all that. a lot of driving you did. Yeah, um, I so I did. Did I tell people where I was going or what? Was I happening? don't think you did. No. So I I uh, I was gone two weekends ago. The weekend, eighteen, nineteenth, twentieth weekend. I went to my sister in law's funeral in Connecticut. Yeah. And I got in the car Thursday morning and drove until I got to Hartford. Connecticut, mm-hmm. and um, crashed at my brother's place, and then went to my friend's house the next day. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't that much further, but I couldn't go any further. Um, and uh, then I spent a 
busy disjointed day friday all day was the funeral saturday mm-hmm. and then we got in the car on sunday and drove part of the way back took a hotel and then drove all day monday yep and and, and that's that yeah. made my life very difficult too i had to work from home for for three days yeah which is interesting and it was very difficult to work from home here with it's a madhouse i a thought madhouse. i thought that our uh, guest would be here but she actually left for a day a day or like, two day yeah. or two and so yeah. she wasn't here to like supervise kids yeah. while i came down here so i had to i had to work from home basically at the at the dining table while all hell broke loose around me constantly <laughs> <laughs> because you know no one could keep it yeah. together yeah so we're just we're um so we were kind of wiped out. Kind of wiped out. And then it took, and then I came right back and jumped into more house stuff and kind of like on the phone all day every day with contractors. The house stuff is giving us both reflux now. Yeah, no, I, and I'm normally yeah. really even keeled with stress. Like I just, it just kind of washes over me. So we're, you know? we're trying to get this work done that the insurance will cover before, before we, we close. close. Right. Some uh, some repairs. There's a water leak repair and there's a bat damage repair. And yeah. the water leak. Well, you got an estimate from one contractor. Yeah. For the um the replacing the insulation in the attic. Oh yeah, Cl- removing the bats, replacing the insulation, putting down antimicrobial. Yeah. Painting. Basically cleaning. Oh, and cleaning the ducts. Cleaning out the attic, cleaning the ducts. Yeah. And that estimate was like. What forty five forty six forty six thousand five hundred dollars? Yeah, and so you no. Know, what was funny? This is the funny part. So we're talking to our real estate agent, and we're yeah. like, "Okay, so this the water claim is settled, and it's not a problem. Um, the back claim, I'm not sure what the holdup is, but you know what? We, we're like a day away from it being settled. We're about to start the work. We're the about work to start the work very, very quickly. It's once like they you know, start. three or four days worth of work. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Right. Yeah. And like the next day, the insurance adjuster calls me and says, have you seen the estimate on the back work? <laughs> I'm just curious. And I'm like, no, what's this estimate? Yeah. I'll email it to you. Yeah. yeah. Like he couldn't even say it over the phone. It, <laughs> and I'm like, seriously, they want $46,000 for this? And he's like, you know, if you wouldn't mind, I think we should get another estimate. Just... Just to check, you know, and see what other people are asking yeah. for similar work. But then as soon as, like, they were going to start the work and we said, no, we hang, no we're delaying, we want to we want to reconsider, they started harassing you. Uh, it's like full-on harassment. They're calling me, they're calling the agent, calling the insurance adjuster, uh, texting me, yeah, emailing me. Literally, they're calling our real estate agent from the, the number the on the sign. Like... You got to get them to let us do this. And I'm like... No, we don't. No, we don't. And and my concern is... I mean, you might you might say to yourself... Why do maybe, you care? Why do I care? Insurance is going to pay for it. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Um, twofold. Number one, I don't want to participate in fraud. Right. N- n- number one, I, I don't want to participate in fraud. Number two, I also have a specific personal incentive. If they start the work... And then expect somebody somewhere to pay them forty six thousand mm-hmm. dollars before they're satisfied. They yes. can place a lien in the house, and we can't sell it. Yes. If they engage the insurance company, and the insurance company wants to drag this out and stall, then the claim is technically not settled, and we can't close the house. We can't close on the house with the open claim, and also or with the lien. With it, we can't if it has a lien from the them or an open claim. We can't close in the house. So even if they do the work lickety split. Then it we're could in a still bind. drag on. It could drag yeah. on for months. Sometimes, yeah. you know, when you get this, because basically, and, and here's, I, I figured out the loophole that these people are working with. Mm-hmm. The loophole is, if I'm insured for this, right. and they cover it, and I choose someone to do the work, and they do the work, in the state of Michigan, the bottom line is they have to pay them. Mm-hmm. They take our deductible, and then they have to pay them. The insurance company has to yes. pay them. And they can fight tooth and nail. All they want, yeah, but the insurance company has to pay them. Right. So, um, 
And that's, you know, if this is actually a covered expense, which the insurance companies already agree is a covered expense. This damage is a covered expense. Right, et cetera. Yeah. We pay our, our $1,000 deductible or five, you know, whatever our deductible is, and then they cover the rest. It's actually just a, another thing that's making me nervous and making our life difficult is in the same couple of weeks where you had to spend, you know, a fair amount to travel, right? Yeah. Including a big, uh, renting a, a van. Right. Um. We we're having to spend a lot of money, and they are going to require us to pay our deductible, deductible. out, which is actually two thousand for, for two the claims. two right. claims. Right. So it's all all coming we're, at we're once. We're getting hit by a lot of boom, boom, expenses. Boom. I should also mention that uh, we discovered just a day, like the day of the heat wave, a couple, like two days before the heat wave or something. The air conditioning in our truck is out. Air conditioning the truck Stopped is out. Stop working. Air conditioning in the house is out. And the air conditioning in the house is out. So good we, times. It's good times. So we do have central air in the house. And we, like last year, we didn't really need it much. So we didn't use it much. So we didn't use it. Um, but it, it was not working at the end of last summer. And it's just one of those things I was hoping we could put off until we finally close this stuff. So I don't, because, you know, I, I earned this great salary, um, but... We're we're actually living on our credit cards just a bit. Yeah, just so to over the skate by. We've basically been losing money each month and making it up in volume. volume. Ding. So over the last year and a couple months, um, I've basically bit been slightly going slightly over, putting just racking up credit card debt just a little bit, bit by bit. Which is frustrating because right before we moved, I pretty much paid off all, all the credit cards, debts. all the all the loose debts, all the loose debts, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, but now it's been like a year, and it's just it's just a little over. That's the thing, but it's right. just enough that we $50 need fifty dollars here. That I need to put something on the credit $75 card, and, and here. now it's here we are with credit card debt again, and. It's just very frustrating, and you know. Plus, we're about to borrow twenty five thousand just to sell our house, so we can sell it for the privilege of not paying the mortgage anymore. For the privilege of losing sixty thousand dollars on our house, we're going to borrow twenty five thousand. Yeah, well, this isn't the house episode. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, we won't go. Anyway, we won't go all the way into the house. But we should mention really quick that we did get another estimate on the yes. attic work and it was nine something. Oh, not even it was, it was 6,900. Okay. Yeah. So just drive 7,000. Yeah. Which is in the ballpark of what I was thinking. I was expecting around 10 grand. Right. Well, yeah. To like, to replace all the insulation in the attic. Right. Well, and that doesn't include the, um, the duct, the cleaning. duct work, which is another 700. So, you know, but that's not a, that's a pretty insignificant right. expense as these things go. Right. So, uh, the, yeah. So, just to compare those two estimates and say, hmm, hmm, things hmm. that make you go, hmm. hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So so clearly something fraudulent of some nature was happening. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of what I don't know. Maybe the first place would have done a better job. Maybe. But uh, you know, we gotta we gotta wonder how gotta much wonder. better. <laughs> how much better? Really? Yeah. Like. That much eight better. times better. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. So that was the house saga. It, so that like blew up the day after. I'm like, oh, it looks like we're we're getting we're yeah. in good shape. And it's been and it's a lot been of stress because we had told new every day. we had told our agent and this and the seller's agent that the work should be actually be done within like by the end of this week. This week. So now we're pushing it into next week. Uh, yeah. And um, and hopefully. Hopefully it all comes together this week, and we close on the fifteenth. Maybe, hopefully, about we'll thereabouts. See. Yeah, um, we just want to be done. But it's, yeah, we just want to be done. But this, so this whole two weeks, we've got this heat wave, and I'm worthless. In, about heat, 80, in high yeah. temperatures, like yeah. eighty degrees. She just like flops over, flops over <laughs> like a puddle, and you know. Yes. I, I don't know if this is like a. A, a disability in the DSM, but this is the problem that I have. <laughs> I think you could could get compensation for that. No, I knew this about you going way back. Way back. Because even yeah. when we were dating, you were over at my apartment one time, and I was like, "Oh, it's pretty hot in here," and I'm and I'm sweating. 
Right. But you like came in and you like looked stricken and you just sort of fell face down on the bed and passed out. Just passed out. Just, yeah. I mean, not like I was going to call out an ambulance, I'm but, just, but like, I was clearly like you needed desperately needed a nap. Like a there nap. was nothing you could do. Yeah. I know there's no chatting I'm going to do right now. I'm not going <laughs> to. No, I don't want a coffee. I don't yeah. want anything to drink. Just leave me alone. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't really like hot temperatures at all, but I right. can function, I think. Uh, at least uh, 10 or 15 degrees higher than, yes. than you Yes, I'm can. barely functional at about 80 degrees. I can still do stuff. I don't really enjoy it, but anyway. So, but it, it was yeah, hot enough, stretch. fast enough to make us concerned, and so humid, too. Yeah. That, like, the feels like was, was off the charts, you know? Right. But, yeah, I was actually, it was getting to the point where, so, and, be, and partly because it hit so fast, we haven't been acclimatized to heat. Right. And uh, I was worried about heat stroke, heat, stroke. heat exhaustion, well, no, and, I think and we were, was shaky and and you know pale. And we like, were flirting with heat exhaustion two or three times that week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The babies, however, were fine. We kept throwing waters on the babies and yeah. nursing them and cuddling them and letting them no. roll around nearly naked or you know, completely naked. It was you and me that were really like we really struggled. Well. Yeah, but we did. We made it, and um, yeah, on Memorial Day we got out to visit. Your brother's gravesite as well, which is yes. our tradition, and, and we almost called it off because we were going to be driving with a, in with a truck no with no air conditioning. Six children, <laughs> and it was ninety-eight degrees and, out. And you know the real the what tipped it in favor of going. Yeah, it was only gonna, it's half an hour away now. Right, it used to be we would drive from Saginaw. It was a two-hour drive from yeah. Saginaw, yeah. because it's not, it's not like it's, it's like there's no there from e- here. The south and the east, you've yeah. got to take several roads. several roads back and forth and switchbacks. Yeah, but um, it wasn't that far. It wasn't that far, and we stopped for AC on the way home. Afterwards, yeah, we found the Barnes and Noble on Haggerty Road, and in um, what is even in this? this I think it's Northville. Uh, or is that? Livonia. It's Liv- it technically Livonia. It's like right at a, in between at a town line. several of these different towns. It's That's like this wasteland, honestly. Yeah, it's just it's just like um, high end strip malls, you yeah. know. But it, yeah, that didn't make any sense. There's no signage. But we got in there and Where everyone got a everyone got a frappuccino and th- we were then thirty bucks poorer. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> got to pay for the AC. Got to pay for the AC. But we spent several hours chilling. In Barnes and Noble, literally cooling down and preparing ourselves for the rest of the drive back, mm-hmm. and, but we made it. It was fine. It. it was okay. It was yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So that meant um, a, a podcast didn't happen that weekend. A podcast didn't happen the weekend no. I was gone, and so yeah, it's been like three weeks. We barely survived to the cold weather, and it's not even cold again. It's like in the sixties and seventies. Sixties at night, no, seventy during it, the day. It it cooled down, but well, it, yeah, it was in the. The low sixties. Yeah, it was gorgeous. Night, just night. having a breeze through the through the room. Oh my god, such, such a relief. Like, so yeah. yeah, sweet relief. And we oh also all last week we were trying to get a person out to look at the AC because we got to get that fixed. Four days. Not, I didn't even get a call back. Yeah, four days. So apparently the company that did it. The, whose number is on the or, unit? I don't know what their situation is. Was maybe swamped, either swamped with work or just I don't know. Like you say, out of business. Who knows? Not answering the phone. Yeah. So, and it, but it's it may be warm this week. I don't I don't know for sure. I don't I don't well, trust the. Well, the I I solicited some names, and the, an AC guy's coming tomorrow. We got another company coming yeah. out tomorrow. So. And I've got a list of names in case they fall through. Okay. <laughs> So we'll we'll get it fixed. We don't even we don't need to have it that cold in here. We just got to no. take the humidity down. I just a we just bit. need it, yeah with the humidity down and really if you can get it below eighty yeah I'm not actually looking for it to be cold inside. No, but get, especially to sleep. Right. Get it like below eighty and get the humidity down and we can and we, we're and good then, to go. then you're good with just a fan. If the humidity yeah, is lower, the fan will work better. Right. It's much It'll more It'll actually effective. cool you down. But yeah, we've got we've got a get someone on that um but yeah what a mess and then um yeah. for like it's just it's really ringing me out to um so we're now basically trying to at plus the the days that i was home working from home mm-hmm. trying to make um home cooked meals three meals for a day 12 people 12 people three times a day 
Yeah, seven days a week. And clean everything up after each meal. Yep. We have to run the dishwasher a minimum of two full loads a day. Two full loads a day, sometimes three. Sometimes three. And and, and yeah. trying to, to, to uh, herd the cats to get the kids to all participate <laughs> yeah, in this. <laughs> to do their chores, to help and all that, you know. It's it's harder than just doing it ourselves, honestly. But really but we is. have to do it. It's part of the discipline of part teaching of the discipline them, of raising children. Yeah, is to and, let them. And they do often help, but they're, they're often very be, helpful. It can be just randomly, randomly awful. Randomly awful. <laughs> like seriously. Like ask them three sweeping? times to to do a, a little cleanup job, and you know come back and tell us three times that they did it. And then the morning, you were just lying to You're us. You're lying. Like, what is this? What have you done? Yeah. I washed that corner over there. Yeah. I did. Anyway, so. <laughs> well, no. Last and last week we actually threw in the towel one night and got Chinese. It was just yeah, so I was. Yeah. I I did into this phase where I was actually terrified of the stove. <laughs> just like standing in the corner of the room staring. Don't at, turn it on. At it. No. Don't turn it on. No, not the stove. No. <laughs> I have to cook Into something. The oven. God help me. And so the Instant Pot rescued me a few nights. Oh, yeah. we A couple nights we threw chicken legs and rice in the Instant Pot and had a quick uh, A quick meal and a salad. It was good. But, all, that's yeah. all, in the summer, all I want for dinner usually is a salad, a salad and a protein. And like, you know, maybe a beer or a lot of water. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's it. That's I don't it. need anything else. I don't like nothing. No carbs. So it was know. good. Like well, like veggies, like you know. Sure. But but like the the potatoes, the rice, the pasta no. aren't even appealing actually. No, because no. you don't. We're not burning any calories to to, um, to warm, warm ourselves. No. You know. Anyway. So yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to rattle on, but we are. But it was an exhausting three weeks. Just so you know. Yeah. We just felt you should know. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing actually bad has happened. No. But like just this, all, it kept like stuff be, kept being on the verge of falling apart. On the verge apart. of being bad, on the verge like, of falling apart. Yeah. And it's it just like. And it was, I, it was wonderful to see my family. I hate seeing family for funerals only. It would be nice to yes. see them for something more yeah. Yeah. Uh, celebratory. Yeah. Um, it was, I stayed with a friend of mine I haven't seen in like 30 years. It was yeah. so wonderful to see her. That's great. Um. So there were all these good things. There were lots of good things, yeah. right? But uh, but man, it, it, three weeks it kind of kicked my ass. Yeah, and then you know, really, we discovered like just how poorly we slept all week while it was so hot. Because when yeah. it cooled down, suddenly we're like, I actually rested, you know. And then yeah. today, all we wanted to do was just take a nap. In the take a nap. And like, and and just, like, what kind of a relax. lazy idiots are we so no we're actually fried fried and exhausted yeah it's been a long week it's been a long three weeks honestly. Yeah. you yeah. did well, I, one more quick thing you did get out and work on the garden <laughs> Woohoo! i did like as soon as it cooled down finally finally cooled down i got out into the garden and i'm so just and it's not even <laughs> so out of shape it was like i'm still sore <laughs> but you're not even this year i mean we've we've did some really uh, ambitious gardening projects over the years yeah but this year you're not even trying to do anything ambitious it's like a few small things to grow so just, just to seeds, get back just into get, it get just back. to get started right but and f and we just haven't been able to but finally yeah. you're out there doing that i'm so happy to see you working on that yeah no it's really good it's restorative yeah and the kids will be involved in it too mm -hmm. so i planted some flowers and i planted greens and pumpkins and cucumbers and some more greens yeah it's cool and greens and nasturtiums we're using uh hay bales as little raised beds yeah I'm trying that. Which, yeah, which I, I've heard great things about. They're really well seasoned. You put the soil, a little soil on top. Yep. And the seeds sprout and then they just grow right into the yeah into the straw bales. It's it's sort of like a version of the Hugel culture. It beds. is. Which is kind of like, I'm really a, a Hugel culture convert now. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. The, Can't go if back. You, if you haven't heard um, about our Hugel culture project, go back in the feed, in, in the blog, there's like... From last year, we re-ran a uh, conversation I had with Grace. I think it's conversation 10 or episode 10 of uh, some, something like that. 
But I think you titled it like "We're in the Garden." In the Garden, yeah, yeah. and that's that's um, all about what we were actually doing with our garden beds, and it's uh, that's one of my favorite recordings yeah. we ever made. Well, no, and and those that, those gardens were amazing. We were we were eating so much great food out of our gardens. That was, so we had this wonderfully, amazingly productive first year, where yeah. we were like eating salad out of the garden every night we had fried squash blossoms and all these lovely fresh foods out yep. of the garden yep radishes like nobody's business um i haven't had radishes that good since until um our csa here yes oh yeah those yeah. the csa radishes like blew I don't my usually, mind i don't usually like to just eat radishes those just by themselves fantastic. yes but these were so tasty that i would just like sit there and eat them like candies yeah yeah Ooh, butter <laughs> they were yeah. they were great um but that year was great yeah what i was really most impressed about that which isn't i don't think in that recording yeah was the following years i would at random go out in the summertime mm -hmm. and harvest from those beds because things self-seeded and self-watered in those hocal culture beds and you didn't even really do much work i didn't even do much them. work exactly so yeah. like the the, yeah. the summers after that yeah like one what well, i think one year you'd lost your job the I next love, year was this going on next year was that we going on we didn't have the time and energy to put into it as a project as again. a project on the same level and we, we were hoping to expand it and keep growing everything and right all that. but but things got life got in the way and i think one or two seasons i did a little bit yeah but every season after that you got a little I, something. I got a little something. Yeah. With in some seasons, with literally no effort, no it, weeding, it no watering, no nothing. Gifts that kept on giving. Just kept on giving. It, it was really amazing. Or a virtuous cycle, I guess you might call it. I really think so. So we want to get back to that. We want to get lots of raised beds and lots of stuff going. And raised so, culture beds. And a lot yeah. of a lot of variety, so that such that even if. Um, one or two things don't work we still got lots of things yeah. that do work it's not the end of the world yeah. and we want to get into the whole the actual like permaculture food jungle concept mm -hmm. with our woods too where yes. we're actually oh, growing the woods. growing some crops literally in, in the, the woods, woods not tilled and not you know whatever like uh, yeah. yeah we're hoping to grow tea we're hoping to grow hazelnuts we're hoping uh, tea to grow and blueberries blueberries just mm -hmm. all kinds of of good stuff which I know people think, oh, that's blueberries are nice. Uh, you know, hazelnuts are nice. Yeah. Um, for many cultures, uh, it, we think of wheat as a staple. Right. But actually, for many cultures, things like blueberries and hazelnuts and um, medicinal herbs were their mm -hmm. staple cr crops, if you will. Yeah. But those yeah. are the things they relied on for food throughout various seasons. Yeah. No, we're, we're hoping to, to be back to eating a lot of our food from our garden from our garden yeah. yeah so we're not there yet we're not there but but, uh, but it's so glad to see us at least even baby steps in the right direction it. yeah even baby steps okay yeah so yeah is that Where it we now? i think that's it <laughs> i think we've we've done the you know do you want to do our topic or not oh yeah let's do the topic that could be good i mean you know we've got some stuff we've got some stuff to talk about yeah we do we so do. that was like us and us like missing you guys and talking about what's been yeah we, we miss you guys but um but yeah we actually did have a topic for today we today. did have a topic but we're tired and i'm going to try and get through it with uh alacrity which means we're, we're only going to speak for an hour and 40 minutes not, not three, hours. three hours yeah, yeah. Anyway. so bonus for you so a few uh a few articles we've been pulling out and mm -hmm. i i have basically been overwhelmed trying to select topics yeah, there's because, so much to talk about. Yeah, there's so much recently to talk about. Every yeah. time I come up across an interesting article, I save it as a PDF file to a folder on my computer. And then I was going back and looking through the folder, and there are like a good 200 articles in there. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Click. That's an uh, interesting one. And Click. I'm thinking like, okay, mm -hmm. how do I organize these so we could start doing topics related to some of the articles so I, this was just a uh, one, one skim thing. through there right right the topic is what do we say <laughs> raising a family in this economy it's raising a family uh, yes and 
I, I wanted I want to extend that yeah. into what the state can do to assist families. Oh yeah, family policy. How what what the state what what uh, policies there should be that are family friendly. Right. And sort of where's the line between here's a family friendly policy and here's a, a creepy in loco parentis uh, state invading state your, invading policy <laughs> invading like your what the hell policy personal lives policy. <laughs> Do I know you? I'm from the state. I'm here to help. Yeah. So we're going <laughs> to talk about underwear drawer. What are you doing in there? <laughs> mention a few a few ideas along there. And just to to reiterate, I am more of a socialist as no. far as a a New Deal Democrat and a welfare state. Um, guy, yeah. Grace is more of an anarchist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The state can go screw itself, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, yeah, we have a mixed yeah. marriage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is from Vox. The record low birth rate offers yet another sign that millennials are economically screwed. Ding. Would you have kids if you were drowning in debt? By Alex Press. I follow Alex on Twitter, by the way. Oh, yeah. Is he good? She. She? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, she's good. Mm -hmm. Um, The birth rate in the United States is the lowest it's been in 30 years, we recently learned. And the decline is spreading across age cohorts. Wait, what? Decline spreading across age cohorts. Okay, go ahead. The reduction, all Mm -hmm. cohorts, different age cohorts are are dropping birth rate. Mm -hmm. In the past, the explanation for this was straightforward. As women gained greater access to educational and workplace opportunities, along with more accessible and effective contraceptives, some of them delayed having children. Of course. And... Actually, we we think of that as... As as positive, but... As a positive thing, also when we export it. And we see this when we export education to other countries, that the age of the first uh, children usually... Increases. Um, increases. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's only a positive so far, going so far. Yeah, up to a point. Like, you know, 13-year-olds getting pregnant and forced into child marriages and all that, maybe not so great. But I, um, delaying indefinitely, not necessarily a huge win for for the family and the... and the Society, for all society. of us, the community. I, and, and not... Just to be clear, I'm not endorsing child marriage... Um, but you all? do endorse early early marriage. Sure, I, I think I think it's I think it's healthy and good and fine for people to get married earlier than is like um, common now. Common in in the United States. And you think well, I, you also think that women should have their children early than the probably like starting, under thirty, starting in their twenties. In their twenties, definitely. Well, having given birth in my twenties, my thirties, right. and my forties, right. I definitely recommend your twenties, <laughs> like without reservation or qualification. It's just a lot easier. Yeah, it's on your so body. much easier on your body, yeah. and really, you're much. I don't know how to put this. You're better equipped for the job. Yeah. I mean, I have experience now, and that's good. But I also have older kids now. Right. That's. I'm not going to pretend that's not happening. Well, we still have a one year old, so I mean. Yes, but she's playing with our older kids right now. Yeah. Which is something that wouldn't be available to us if I was this age and had a one year old. Yeah. And no other children. So, so yes, I'm. I'm. I'm a big advocate of women diving in and taking the biological opportunity early. And paying no penalty for it, physically, yeah. um, physically. But no, there should be, and there should be no social penalty whatsoever for right. having your children. Right, and delaying at all. I mean, delaying to establish a career. I think we can probably you know, consider it as something that women feel forced into, and that may not be optimal for them. Right, right. I don't think that's actually optimal optimal for women. Um, lots of things. I could go on about this right. all day. Okay, um, so we're... But yeah, but, oh, I was making a comment about child marriage. That I'm, I was wanted to preface by being very clear that I'm not yes. making any kind of a tacit endorsement of child marriage. Right. What I do mean to say, though, is that I would much prefer that Africans and Asians, South Americans, and indigenous people decide for themselves yeah. how to raise their children sure. Sure. and how they should be educated right. and what's an appropriate marriage age and an appropriate uh, marriage ritual and yeah. function for themselves. I really don't like the idea 
uh, the American or Western yeah. European model right. of family and education being exported wholesale to the few hunter gatherer tribes that exist that right. we like somehow say, well, your kids need to go to school now. And um, they're like, for what? Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is the thing that they we're, need to we're learn discovering English. is we'd actually, we're desperately hoping to become hunter-gatherers hunter again. <laughs> right? So We, we want to go backwards. We go back, actually. <laughs> We've tried this, and I can't recommend it. I mean, I want to keep dental care, you know, For example. stuff like that. But, but yeah, we can talk about dental care. Like I sure. said, anyway. these topics, I could go on all day. Right. My only point is I'm not sure. Actually, I'm confident yes. that exporting our values to other cultures and subsuming their own cultural values is and identity is, is, damaging. is damaging and wrong. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, we can debate about age of birth and first birth and all this other stuff. But anyway, so she, but she's talking about okay, what's the explanation? She says mm -hmm. in part that explanation still holds, especially when it comes to the plummeting birth rate among teenagers. A good thing by all accounts. Were this the extent of the story and the data, a low birth rate wouldn't constitute much of a concern, but a closer look reveals two issues, one ethical, one economic. Yeah. Okay, her point. The ethical concern is that the number of women who want children but aren't having them is growing. Yeah, right. that's real. As Lyman Stone wrote in the New York Times, the gap between the number of children that women say they want to have, which is 2.7, Mm-hmm. And the number of children they will probably actually have, 1.8. Yeah, that's roughly one child less than they were hoping for. Yeah, well, 0.9 children, but, you know, what are you going to do with 0.9 children? Whatever you can, <laughs> you do your best. Have risen, uh, the ga that gap has risen to the highest level in 40 years. Yeah. Um, this is a political problem that needs to be addressed. Um, well, and just to, to speak to that, uh, this, is, this is an anecdote which I understand is not the same mm -hmm. as statistical evidence. But it is the experience that I have. Right. Um, about once a week, I meet a woman who says, oh my God, you have seven kids. That's so wonderful. Or, oh my God, you have seven kids. How do you do it? Something like that. Right. And, and, uh, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, you know, good work if you can get it, <laughs> as I often say. Um, and every basically one out of every five of those conversations. Mm -hmm. So 20% of the time I have this conversation two or three times a week, um, probably at least once a week. And then out of five conversations, one of those women will say to me after a moment or two of chatting about other things, mm -hmm. oh, I really wanted more kids. Yeah. I so yeah. wanted more kids. And yeah. I just couldn't. Couldn't. For, or thought they couldn't. For or, whatever, for whatever yeah. number of constellation of reasons. Um, yeah. It'll be, oh gosh, I so wanted more. And just, I, right. I, I couldn't. So, uh, yeah, so that's the first point, is that this mm -hmm. represents a political problem because now we have people actually discontent with, you know. They're kind of mad. Right. And feeling like they haven't fulfilled their, their life's potential and yeah. the hopes for their lives. Um, but the, There's also this pesky economic problem. The economic problem. Following a significant drop in the birth rate after the 2008 recession, Women are continuing to have fewer children. Yeah. So supposedly the recession is over, right? <laughs> That's cute. Um, there are many reasons besides <laughs> economic so incentives <laughs> to put off having children, as uh, Vox's Julia Belouz points out. Uh, but the economy plays a role. One study even found fertility rates to be a leading economic indicator. No joke. Predicting downturns and upticks in advance. Without question. Which is like... It's like the woolly bear caterpillars predicting the weather, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's a good indicator. Um, yeah, Pretty so well spot on. Closely, fertility rates closely linked to the souring of the economy that began about 2008. Mm -hmm. One reason is that the economy hasn't recovered. So oh. just skimming ahead here, I'm just Economy picking, hasn't recovered. Picking some phrases. Uh, indebtedness oh. is through the roof. Credit card debt in the U.S. surpassed $1 trillion. Holy smokes. Yeah, and I own a chunk of that, right? Yeah, no, we do. While student debt hit the $1 trillion mark six years ago. Damn. It astounds me that, that um, student, student debt is more than all the credit card debt in the in the country. That's amazing. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Meanwhile, perusing crowdfunding sites like GoFundMe or Kickstarter, and you'll see that one of the most common reasons people use such sites is to seek help with medical debt. Yeah, um, Kickstarter and Go, GoFundMe, they are people's backup health insurance. It's like yeah. then it becomes a popularity contest, and the ones that so lose... So do you get health care? The ones that lose often no, die. No one likes you. I guess you don't. Yep. So. Um, Too bad. So sad. Yeah. It's the American way. So, yeah, especially, and then, of course, she starts on real estate, right? Oh, my God. For many of us. Anywhere you can afford to live. She's talking no about her generation, of people who live with our parents, mm -hmm. or the many more who rent glorified broom closets in apartments we share with multiple roommates. Yeah. The future, if it looks anything like the past, don't expect the birth rate to change soon. The average wage for a worker in the U.S. hasn't budged in 40 years. Yeah. Like, like not at all. Okay. Adjusted for inflation. We're talking. Yeah. Actually adjusted for inflation. It's gone down. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the attacks on unions relentless and continuing that figure yeah. may remain the same for the foreseeable future. Yeah. For those unlucky enough to have been born around 1985. Ooh. Yeah. Tough times. It's reasonable to expect a baby bust. Connor Sen argued at Bloomberg this generation is hitting every milestone at the worst moment, right? So, yeah, they, uh, the entering the job market when the job markets crashed, getting ready to buy their first There's home no when the housing market's insane or right. crashed. Yeah. Meanwhile, the U.S. remains one of only four countries that don't mandate paid maternity leave. Well, how could you? Why would an employer <laughs> pay you if you're not there? Duh. The other three are Lesotho, Papua New Guinea, and Swaziland. <laughs> Swaziland, yeah. Um, all, Which yeah. arguably have a cultural environment that would support not having paid maternity leave. Would su support extended families. And, so, yeah. you know. 56, yeah. Only 56% of companies in the U.S. offer maternity leaves. Of any kind. And of those, only 6% support providing full pay during the leave. Mm. So it's, now she's not saying how many jobs. It would be useful to see how many people, like how many jobs. Like how many people actually have access have to Have access to that. Right. That that would actually be a much more insightful figure, but I, it's hard to kind of figure out. Yeah. So then she talks about, you well, know. That's personal information, you know. Uh, none of this is really new, right? We've known. No, we know about information this. Information in this article, you know. Um She's just citing some new reports and new data. Uh, the cost of daycare, the average cost of daycare in the U.S., $9,589 annually. It's like going to state college. Higher than the average cost of in-state tuition. Yeah. So you start out by sending them to state college day right, one. Right. Giving birth. Cha ching Giving birth. It costs more to give birth here than the Duchess of Windsor spends to give birth. It I just want to be clear it, about that. <laughs> Thirty-two, more than thirty-two thousand dollars. <laughs> it only cost her like twenty, and she gets a whole hospital award. <laughs> Sorry. More expensive to give birth in the United States than any other country at all, anywhere. Now, honestly, if I hadn't been unemployed mm -hmm. while we had a couple of these babies, well, we'd be in terrible shape. We'd be in terrible shape, but because I happened to be unemployed, we were on Medicaid that covered. Everything. Oh, and I just want to get a plug in here. Yeah. The fact that Medicaid in Michigan yeah. specifically covers pregnant women and children right. in that way was actually an initiative from Right to Life when, before they were crazy. And that's not true in every state. It's not true in every state. You're not necessarily automatically covered. It may be true now, right? That may be one of the things that happened with the Affordable Care Act. Well, but I then think, some some states didn't the, take the, it. Part of the some, expansion, right. right? Yeah. But but that's been true in Michigan for like thirty years. Right. That the fact that you're pregnant qualifies you for Medicaid. Right. And your pregnancy is paid for. Yeah. In full in the state so of Michigan. I think twice it's happened that mm -hmm. you were pregnant and I just happened to lose my job shortly before. Shortly before. Before yes. the birth. <laughs> right. 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 And Medicaid. Kicked, kicked in and covered and everything helped. so it was like what that was 60 grand right there yeah and even when um but i forget which job it was i think with uh electronics or so we I, always end up owing money 
Yes, but it was. Uh, I don't. I've only ever paid a few thousand dollars, right, for inexpenses for a birth. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Um, uh, I think it was only was two or three thousand dollars for Sam. Yeah, it, it, it I didn't don't similar for Josh. I don't remember for sure, but it was it was manageable. Right, given we, my, we didn't blow us out of the water. Right. But um yeah and um I have what you would call now actually gold plated insurance it's really yeah. a good plan. Oh yeah. We didn't like we didn't have to we paid deal with almost nothing for, for open the, heart surgery for baby. Well for your C-section for, C for her birth. Right. And for her open heart surgery we paid right. almost nothing. Yeah but they did want to fight us hard about some of those meds. Some of the little <laughs> Like, are you sure? Are you sure yeah, she needs that? I'm just yeah, asking. Right, right. <laughs> but no, I mean, any of those things could have bankrupted us. Oh, completely bankrupted and, us. And, you know, in 2002, I had an ER stay. Oh, God, that was $10,000. That wound up costing me ten grand, and we had to yeah. fight and pay for 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 years, years. to pay that off. I, I think it Back took us then. six years to pay that off. Well, there, we had other debts we tried to consolidate right, as well. Right. But after but, all was said and done, it was six years later before it was gone. Yeah. Yeah, and that was Man. that was 16 years ago, and mm -hmm. things are much worse now as far as what ER oh, yeah. ERs charge. The perversions that they go go through at hospitals with it's ER. It's more and well, more. What was you were telling me today? You were telling me how so like they charge you for how long you were sitting in the waiting room. Apparently, Basically, they charge you rent. Apparently, for sitting this in the waiting is room. a thing now that ERs are billing insurance companies. For the hours you spent sitting on your ass in a chair in the waiting room. Which seems like they now have an incentive to make you wait longer. It's part of some kind of facility fee, but apparently now it's by the hour or something. Which, it's like it's like having to buy a coffee to rent a table at Starbucks or something. Right, I, I, except it's a lot more than a coffee. Except it's a lot more. So yeah, this so person, the coffee free in the, this in person the ER waited, waiting waited just, like three hours in the ER and... And the ER was trying to bill their insurance company for five hundred and thirty-five dollars, like waiting room fee or something like that. It was, and someone posted this on Twitter. I'm like, "What? This is new. That this is crazy." Be. And all these people chimed in and said, "Oh yeah, happened yeah. to me too. Yeah, I've been there, done that." Like, wow. It's, so it's it's crazy. It's just, it's just crazier just, every day. Every day, just more off the rails. Yeah. So, yeah, the the. The thing that I think about with this mm -hmm. is, well first, well, first of all, one of the things I think about is like the overpopulation people. Yeah. And I don't know, I, that's kind of only a problem if you're a racist, I, you know what I'm saying? I just, <laughs> I mean, if you're a bigot, I can see how you'd be freaked out. But um, actually, the demographic bust that we're facing yeah. is devastating. I mean, it's devastating on a personal level. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, some of the women I've talked to who didn't have children they wanted yeah. are, they grieve that every day. Well, and they were, they came up in a culture and a, a, a wanting to, to have that. You right, know? right. There are plenty of people who just don't want kids, you know. Oh, no, no. And I'm, I'm not talking yeah. about that yeah. or them. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's something people feel that's real, that they don't want kids. That's a real way to feel, and people feel that, and I'm not judging or concerned or like, plenty, plenty pretending of, that's not true. Yeah. Um, what I'm talking about are women who um, wanted more children, couldn't for some reason have more children. Or had and, to delay so long that they then literally couldn't. They know. literally couldn't. They had to wait so long and wait, and then they couldn't <clears throat> have children. Yeah. They have a deep grief and resentment and, re and resentment and really yeah. deep grief so that's like a personal yeah. on a personal level yeah. but the the sort of like socioeconomic and cultural impact right. of all these literally missing children right and then missing young adults right and then missing adults that has a fundamental impact on our culture on our society and on our economy and I feel a little bit like the overpopulation folks don't understand that that that's real. Mm -hmm. that, that that you know there was a trajectory we could have a trajectory we could have followed that would have been different. Yeah. There would have been more people to pay for wel the welfare state. Yeah, yeah. So it really was just a nominal cost. 
Right. Especially in a, in a nation this large. It really could have been nominal if some of these folks weren't missing. Right. But, you know. Well, well that's where she gets to. Um, she, she mentions that uh, our culture now, and this is part of late capitalism, we, mm-hmm. and to use uh, her words, valorizes insecurity. Oh, yeah, that's heroic. Um, points to the gig economy's precarity and calls it flexibility and innovation. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and so that's that's really a thing. It's it's a, you see it in advertising. You see it in like, you know, yeah, it's kind of perverse. You can control your destiny. You know, it's just it's all in harder. your hands. It's all in your hands. Work harder. Which you know the flip side of, the flip side of that is that if it's not working out, it's your fault. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it's your it's a personal failing. It's, it's personal not failing. a systemic failure. Right. Yeah. That's just you. That's on you, man. So that but then uh, she says, okay, this is what this does to the economy, economy, right? Um, Potential to exacerbate economic strain. Total fertility rate dropped to 1.76 in 2017, which is well below replacement. Mm -hmm. We're already looking at a demographic problem with the social security system because of the the boomers. And to be clear. the, The elephant in the python. That demographic problem is easily solvable. I don't mean I don't want to like do a scaremongering thing. Well, social security doesn't work. That's not no. Why this it's, is going it's entirely a matter of political will. It's not yeah. like it's not a given that a system's set up to fail. It's set right. up to to be corrected, to be corrected. Fixed. So we've got a we've got this python, this uh, elephant coming down the python. We can see it and we can course correct to manage it. It's not actually the end of the world. Yeah. But this will not actually help the management, this demographic no. sort of no. cratering that we're looking at. It's not going to help that situation in any respect. Yeah. And uh, she worries that, okay, now when people in power start to react to this, mm-hmm. the response is, is going to be a kind of natalism, which like the Handmaid's Tale world, you know, oh, yeah. where, um, you know, in other words, okay, so... Maybe you know what we got to do to bring the birth rate up. We have to make abortion illegal, you know, completely illegal, right? Hey, you know, I'm not. You're not gonna hear me cry. So, well, you know. uh, yes, I, but but yes, but. Um, so this is the thing. You've got to have social security is not actually a fund where you save up the money that you work at. The save up money that you yeah, saved so works. during your work life. There have to be enough people in the workforce to get your pay own Social money Security. back out. No, it's and thank God. Thank God. And thank God for that. It was not designed to be that. No, it's a system where current workers pay for people who are retired and receiving benefits, Precisely. and not always retired. Right? There are right. other other people who Disabled get Social people, Security, you know, et cetera. Right? Children, so, of, children of retirees and whatnot. Yeah, but it does to really function well. Mm-hmm. It does need enough people paying in yeah. to pay for what's going out. I mean, and actually, I've got a great conservative friend who I should probably ask him if he wants to come on the on the podcast and talk about some of these yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, one thing he says is, "I'd like people to understand how Social Security works." Yeah. I think for them to understand, yeah, they would have to agree to live only on the excess income of their children. <laughs> if you're willing to live only on the excess income yeah, of your children, yeah. then you understand what's happening with Social Security. But but it does. It's not quite that because they do have a trust fund and they do invest part yes, of their money, right? Right. Well, so. no, and ideally, you've done something like that with your kids, right? Right. You right. put a little money aside for them. Yeah. You've done something to kind of cushion their right. their move into adulthood, and there's all these buffers, ideally, that yes. you've made for that system. Yeah. So, you know, you have one child that's in a terrible accident and maybe, you know, is delayed moving into the workforce or can't go into the workforce or whatever happens. Yeah. But that's the perspective you need to understand that we're talking about you're going to survive based on what the children are able to produce. Mm-hmm. That there's this necessary connection between um, parents and children and between the adults in our society and the children in our society. Yes. There's a fundamental connection between them. Right. That they need each other in order to function and survive. So the other another possible response that will yeah. happen 
is, of course, people will increase and amplify their calls to restructure Social Security. Say, it's going to collapse, so we better take it apart now and turn it into something much less secure. Privatize it. Yeah. And, and, and actually, we're poised for that because all these... All the all the current workers who are paying for a much larger group of retirees are feeling the burden hardest. Yeah. And will likely want to take that for themselves right. in response. Right. So we're getting right. ready to enrage a generation of people ready to retire. Right. Who are voting. Right. <laughs> who who are really gonna be pissed off right. and just wanna send a large fuck you to everyone. Right. Which and, is know. how we got Trump. So, <laughs> so look how that works. Um, this is also a real problem regarding immigration. Yes, right. We can't be because actually we would be feeling a lot more pain from this birth rate right now already. Already, if yes. not for immigration, immigration is really basically masking it, so right. we don't feel the hurt right now. Right. Yeah. It is. A net positive in that sense. Yeah, it's a neck. It's a neck up. Po- Actually, it's the immigrants who are losing. The immigrants who are coming here who are losing out by being here. Right. We're only gaining. Right. So. Um, but we're mad at them for some reason. Why are we mad at them? So. Again? Why are we mad at the immigrants? We hate them. We're mad at them because they're the only ones uh, coming in to work hard enough to prop up our collapsing system. That's why. And that makes us mad. Yeah, something like that. Okay, just checking. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm just trying to keep up, you know? If we're looking at remedies, what are the remedies? Well, yeah, okay, what do we do? One right. of them is to actually embrace immigration, right? That's, That's one, one strategy, <laughs> just embrace immigration. Yes. And actually, I think if we did nothing else, that could work right. for a long time. Yeah. Largely, I, th- I think part of it is... Um, immigrants bring their cultural values with them, and that might shift some of the bullshit culture we have. It would actually help, I think, most of yeah. <laughs> most of our more the more psychotic aspects of, of our, our culture, culture could really be benefit, imi- benefit from immigration. From, yeah, from some immig- um, yeah. some of the values that immigrants bring with yeah, them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But um, yeah, the policies that can that might benefit. She mentions paid leave, subsidized yeah. childcare. Yeah. Um, an end to workplace discrimination against women in general and mothers in particular, right? Oh, yeah. Making it impossible for them to have children and work, right? Yeah. Rent control, universal health care. Um, Details, really. Increases rather than cuts to CHIP. Oh, children's health, yeah. children's health insurance yeah. program. And she mentions the regulation of contract labor in the gig economy, which uh, I think is tied up with unionization, too. Right, right. She doesn't mention uni- no, she doesn't unionization, go union. yeah. but she is, I know from other, her other writing, that she's a big advocate of union. And and to be, I, I should, labor. you know, I've got this, I, I want to be clear. Personally, I'm a huge advocate of labor. I'm a conditional advocate of unions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I'm a huge advocate of labor. So... Uh, I think well, and, th- and one other one of my friends I think described it well that um, actually as long as there are unions, we're not. Ta- I don't. I'm not talking about um, public sector unions. Right. I think it's a different ball. That's a bit of a uh, ball of wax. But as long as unions exist in the private workforce, mm-hmm. that's an indication of uh, injustice. Like their presence means there's an injustice in yeah, play. Yeah, the people feel the need for them. Well, not even that they feel the need for them, but that... So in other words, you only have a union if someone is making a profit off of your labor. Sure. That's the only reason you have a union. Of course. And if someone's it, making a profit off of your labor, they're stealing from you. If it was... A, it's legal. Right. And it's all cool. And, Everyone's and, normalized it. In a democratic workplace, the processes that people, that the workers go through to fight for things through their union would be built into the company. Would built into the company. Structure of the organization. It would, it would structurally. I mean, it, sure. And what it comes yeah. down to is as long as the people that work there don't own the company. Yes. They will need a union. Yeah. And as long as the people that don't work there, as long as the people that work there don't own the company, yeah. it is not just. Yeah. It's fundamentally unjust for someone else to profit off of your labor. I believe that, but you're so, sounding more like me. <laughs> well, so, 
more like a socialist. But that's so. but I, I, that's the thing though. Is yeah. I'm not a like what is are, are those the uh, ANCAPs the yeah. the Anti-capital. libertarian that the libertarian anarchist or something. Yeah, I'm, that's no, I'm not. That's not my jam. Well, but um, well, to unpack that sometime. <laughs> yeah, sometime we can like parse that. But but no, seriously, if unions exist. Mm-hmm. That's an indicator of of oppression and injustice. Right. It's, so so I'm not exactly pro union, right? <laughs> it, but I am pro labor. Yes. So, it's it's well it's a it's a partial solution. Right. To, it's a, a, to, to a systemic problem. Yes. And I think a band aid on a sucking chest wound. <laughs> right. You know, it, it's it's a partial solution. It's a band aid. Right. And I think as long as we're our eyes as we're focused on the band aid as the cure. Yeah. We've missed some important dynamics of the of the situation, but yeah. what's actually happening and who's actually um, profiting off of other people's uh, oppression. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as we were. All right. So, so yeah, unionization would help the, the yeah. birth rate situation. Yes, it would. It would help the birth rate situation. She's got one. Uh, I'm not going to f- read everything in here, but what's your other? Do you have um, one more? One more p- uh, point I thought that was worth mentioning was. Um, uh, those who support the largely bipartisan project of deporting tens of thousands of women and children every year can't well turn around and flat, uh, fret, flat, uh, fret about the birth rate, <laughs> yeah, right, right, or they're conceding that their concern has to do with white women not having enough babies. Oh yeah, um, not the health of the country as a whole, and that's yeah actually what I hear from conservatives. Yeah, white women aren't having, but it's any coded. Babies. Oh yeah, it's the, the demographic shift, the demographic slide, oh, no. the cultural oh, no. the cultural shift that comes oh, from no. immigrants, like, mm. and of course, you know, like air horn dog whistles, like taco truck on every corner, and I'm like, oh, that would be awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's the best thing about that, right? It's like I'm just like salivating, I, I, right? <laughs> That that was like tacos. Say, oh God, that would be awful. Taco trucks on every corner, like Mexican food available everywhere. Yeah. Like, what? And what exactly is? What's is the bad the part? problem? Where's the? Where's, where's the, the bad, bad part, part again? Uh, you know, I guess if you can't, I, no longer... I couldn't drive through town. That's the problem. I have to keep <sighs> stopping. <laughs> you know, I, if if that's true. if we had like one demographic, one culture taking over, mm-hmm. that always causes conflict. So let's say that sudden so many. So many Hispanics move into a neighborhood that all the other restaurants have to pack up and leave, and now it's only taco trucks. That could be bad, I guess. I guess. But um, well, it depends on the tacos. <laughs> I mean, we talking like those, like with the lime wedges, oh, you know, yeah. and the, like the barbacoa. The the no the um what the one with the pineapple. The... Oh, that was pretty good. Oh, or yeah. the fish tacos. The fish though. tacos. Remember La, Me- La, Me- uh, La Fiesta Mexicana? Yeah. Yeah, those fish tacos were. Those were on point. Boss, tilapia, yeah. and and um, like a pico de gallo kind of thing. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Having a moment. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but that's the thing, though. That's the thing. Hispanics aren't one thing. No, they're not. They're I mean, not. we'd be talking about, you know, Hispanics could be from Spain. They could be from Mexico. Sure. They could sure. be, you know. I know, but if we're talking about a specific country, uh, yeah, it's not a real concern. I'm just no, it's kinda, not really. Yeah, I mean, like trying to imagine how yeah, this could be actually. Was, well, a what's problem? actually bad? What's actually it? bad? Well, well, now mind you, you know, if, if if you really believe that change is bad, then maybe it, you feel that it's bad. And there are ways in which I I do embrace the change is bad. Yeah, mantra. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think if your, if your society is healthy and functional, yeah. A large influx of immigrants destabilizes it. Yeah. Now, I, I want to teach, uh, I want to protect my culture and my cultural values. I want to be able to teach Moby Dick. If I have to teach it in Spanish, I'm kind okay of with okay that. with that, right? Yeah. I'll learn Spanish to teach Moby, Moby Dick, Dick in Spanish. Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess that's, that's my only, I do understand this, but this frame that immigration could be bad. Yes. Right? And that it's not a complete um, canard. Right. Because, let's be very clear and very blunt, immigration was terrible for Native Americans. Yes. It was absolutely disastrous. Yes. They had a serious immigration problem. Right. (laughs) Um, 
And none of those people had papers. No. Like not one of those <laughs> bastards had papers. Okay. So I, I think my that's, ancestors came here legally. Uh, uh, uh. No, they didn't. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? Bef- not before, not if they came in before um, Ellis Island. <laughs> right? So there's this, so that's re- that is real. But it's one of those things, again, that it's only real if you're punching up. Yeah. It's only real for someone who's marginalized that a massive immigration to their community would be destabilizing in a really destructive way. Mm-hmm. Just like what we were talking about earlier, that the immigration of our values and our economy and our education system yeah. into indigenous communities is extraordinarily destructive. Yes. Yeah. And we get really wrapped up. Well, are you supporting child marriage and female genital mutilation then? Right. What kind of person are you? You know, actually just back the fuck up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> stop with your, uh... stop with all that. Right. Because honestly, I'm not about, telling people what they're supposed to do and how communities are supposed to live their lives. They've been managing fine without me for a very long time now. Yeah. So whatever issues of injustice they have internally, I'm sure they know about them. Yes. They know about them. They're not confused about the imbalance. I, I don't think... And need, they're probably working on them. I don't think we need to tell other people what to do. Uh, any, also, including things like dealing with hijab, you know? Oh, no, not by a right. long shot. And, and right. frankly, every time I've seen the hijab thing come up, yeah. and people are like, well, you can have the hijab, but not the niqab, or not this, or what. Right. It's about, it's really about telling women what they are allowed, they're allowed to wear. Yeah. And really, it's this thing that we have here in the West, where we actually like women naked, <laughs> so we can mock them for being naked. Something like that. Yeah. Right? We actually prefer that. And so when women come here and say, you know what, I'm not going to walk around naked for you. That's that's sick. Tell me don't play that game. No, right? Suddenly, they're like terrorists or something yeah. if they're not going to walk around naked for our view. Right. And that's all that's happening when I see people talking about the niqab or the, you know, or the burqa or the hijab or any of that. They're um, so oppressed, they don't even get to, to, to walk get around their naked bikini for us. bodies together for summer beach wear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can they live? And fundamentally, if I'm going to support my anarchist friends running around in hoodies and face masks, <laughs> why am I going to have anything to say about a Muslim walk- woman walking around in a niqab yeah. or a burqa? Yeah. She's fine. I don't know. How do I know she's not an anarchist? Really, you know? And yeah. it's not for me to decide what she gets to wear. Right. If that's everything or, you know, nearly nothing. Okay. So, yeah, that's that. I have uh, only three more articles. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just plow through those. Like this. Okay, this Frank one's, one's going to be... We're, we're going we're gonna to set aside the fourth one. It's too long. We'll talk about oh, it that another long, we'll, show. Well, 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 we should like do a teaser. It. We should introduce okay. it. Yeah. Um, this one, mm-hmm. now you prepare to get enraged now that you're all calm after the first one? Yeah, bring it. Okay. This is called Live Free and Die mm. by Henry Graber. G R A B A R Grabar, from uh, this is from Slate. I'm mad already. Go on. Is, <laughs> I, don't yell at the author, okay? He's just he's just the messenger. Is Grandma having trouble with her property taxes? Hmm. A new Manhattan-based startup wants to buy her house and let her live there for free for the rest of her life. Wait, isn't that a reverse mortgage? It's a fucking reverse mortgage. Not exactly. Um, it's it's but he does talk about reverse mortgages. Okay. Okay. God damn this makes problem. sense as a business for a couple of reasons. For one, seniors have the nation's highest home ownership rate. Close to eighty percent of American over Americans over age sixty five own their homes. At the same time, older Americans are increasingly likely to retire without the savings to see them through their twilight years. Mm. Twilight. You get to be a sparkly vampire then? In 2013, median retirement account savings for families aged 56 to 61, (sighs) deep sigh, was just $17,000. Wow. And even the mean, so the the, that That was was the median. median. That's the middle number. The The mean, $163,577. I'm not even going to get up to that by the time I'm... Uh, 61, no. I don't think. Not 61. Was considered far below the recommended rate of 10 times your salary. 
Like, I don't, I'm not going to reveal what the number would be, but let's just say it's pretty laughable, the idea that I'm going to yeah. get there from here while I'm, during the rest of my working years. Climb it out. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm desperately hoping I can pay down enough of either all or enough of this house that you guys can keep the house, you know. That would be nice, but, you know, we'll see. But, yeah, that, I think that's like. <laughs> that's the best we can hope for. Put the two together and you've got the idea behind the startup, Irene. The company will even take care of property taxes and maintenance so your grandparents don't have to clear the gutters or risk falling into foreclosure. The trade-off, a sale price far below market value. Hmm. So this is not uh, just a reverse mortgage kind of thing. Oh, it's this is worse. The company buys your house right, for w- way less. Less than market value in exchange for letting you live there rent and, free. and rent free for the rest of your life. Now what's why won't why won't they kill you? <laughs> so he I, I'm he just then, asking he I, then <laughs> talks about so you remember the Shaheens, right? Right. The that Sha- was their strategy. So the Shaheens are uh, you know we're about to get sued. They're a wealthy family in the Saginaw area. Yep. Right. And they apparently made their nut uh, uh, in that area by basically um, making a deal with Older elderly folks. folks. Mm-hmm. Um, so in exchange for providing the medical care for the rest of their life, yep, they would own their homes. Own their homes. And then they got... The corner and all the property. Right. So they bought up in this way Just a lot of property of, in, in the area. And right. And now they're a big um, they're player. They're a large concern. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the area. They they're do philanthropic stuff, but also oh, it's yeah. largely. Oh, the Shaheens do so much good. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm just anyway, a nostalgic moment. Depends on who. It really depends hey, on who you talk to up there. Yeah, it really does. But some people you talk to, they're like, "Oh my God, they'll Not just them. talk your ear off." Yeah. And furthermore, yeah, right. It's kind of amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And it so is. These, it is. I will say whether you think they do a net net good or or a, or a blight on the the city. Mm-hmm. It it um it. I find it disturbing that any individuals can do this kind of thing legally and amass yeah. a fortune that way. Yeah. And this is a startup. Right? It's a startup. It's like a Silicon Valley startup. Yeah. Except. This is, no, Silicon Alley, Paul. <laughs> They're from Manhattan. From Manhattan. It's different. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, I'm God, not a, shooting the messenger. What but, a dumpster fire. Okay, can we, go ahead. But I'm just going to say, I think this kind of thing is also very much related to the future of families and how policy affects families because this is not necessarily a, a bad deal for the senior. No. Right? Not really. But it is... Except they they have motivation to kill you. Well, okay. But, but go on. Assume they won't kill them. But, and that That's they'll actually go on. follow through with all their obligations. Right. But this has, okay, so once the senior has died, mm-hmm. the they get the house. They get the house, and now you have more homes all over the country that are going to be owned by Corporate w- owned. Wall Street. By, yeah. And in the process, they have taken another step in the looting of community wealth. Yes. And by that community, won't pass hands. And, but now, mind you, by community, I mean going all the way down to the family level. Yes, that which ad, is the primary unit of a community. That house could have been an asset passed on to family members, right? Or lived in by or family lived in members. members. And now, here's here's the question I have to ask you: Who do you think is going to swoop in and take advantage of this offer? What if, describe, if you will, the demographic of the seniors that are going to be selling their homes to these people? Well, tell me what you're thinking, because I don't... Who, who, who is it ever that, that ends up on the short end of the stick? Oh, here? just, you don't mean demographic, you mean income level. Well, and also demographic. Yeah. Right. Yes. This is good. So, so poor people well, are going to lose maybe, their homes. But I, I don't think they want to buy up homes in poor neighborhoods. Poor people don't always live in poor neighborhoods. Well, that is true. Yeah. That is true, right? But I don't. I don't know that they're going to target 
truly low income people with this deal because they don't they want to own valuable property. But that's how these scavengers work, though. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's gentrification. Process. Right. It's a, it's a gentrification process. Yeah. So yeah, it would be fine to target. Uh, they're going to turn them into rentals. Well, tur- their so their their plan is to turn them into rentals, or their plan is to, is to is to flip them. Like, what's their business model on the on the other end? So once once grandma dies, and they get the house, then then they profit. Like, what what happens next? Does it say? Um. Let's see. They've got seed funding. Um, they're having to figure out how to do with maintenance. Mm-hmm. Larger trend. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's. I'll just read this section. There's a kind of morbid bet at work here. T- Tiso said, "Irene is a long-term property investor, mm-hmm. but the company's financial fortunes are dependent on the well-being of its tenants." Right. Right. If a 70-year-old receives a $200,000 cash payout for the right to live until he dies in a $400,000 house, right. but dies the next year, Irene has made a great deal. Right. If he lives to be 105, <laughs> Not a the company is stuck paying for decades of taxes. And I'm and serious. I, I, I wasn't just joking. Yeah. Where's Why, the incentive for them not to kill right, you? <laughs> right. Right. As soon as it becomes more costly for them. Yeah. He, they do. He mentions um, the more expensive your house, the more tempting the prospect of such a contract. Hugh Hefner actually sold the Playboy Mansion with a lifetime rent clause. Yep. Shortly before he died. Sure. Right. These arrangements are common elsewhere too. Buyers use similar contracts to help seniors unlock home equity without moving out. In France, called Avviage. Hmm. I've never heard of it. And in Tissot's native Italy. Under the Mm -hmm. French system, buyers are prohibited from researching occupant health. Mm -hmm. And sellers have been known to act frail to attain a good deal. (laughs) Like walk in with a cane. I'm barely... Oh, I've got emphysema. Springing back to tennis... (sighs) Senior tennis matches before the ink on the contract is dry. (laughs) Yeah. I can't really blame him. (laughs) Um, then Then he says... Uh, this is where you do start to despise the author. Right. Where it says, in some, it's probably a good idea for some seniors. <laughs> <laughs> Though one that can hardly measure up to the scope of the problem. That's the real point is this, the aging se- this seniors. This doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve it. Then this is a big problem. It's right. a demographic it's a big, yeah. crisis. A huge right? demographic crisis. And, and yeah. this doesn't solve it, right? But it's just this sort of predatory thing yeah. where more wealth is sucked out of a community. Yeah. So, and like, and in this sort of imperceptible way, the house still looks nice. <laughs> there's a quote from Alicia Monell, the director of the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. She says, I'm a big fan of using home equity in retirement. The vast majority of people are not going to have enough. That's the problem. And right. this is not the solution. All right, no. This is further extracting value from communities from small communities all over the country feeding it to wall street it's a vampire squid deal and and what and and it's destroying generational intergenerational wealth right and we're not talking about the trump family right we're talking about family we're not even talking about the shaheen family families whose only asset to pass on is the house and the value in the house that they've accumulated in the house and that's because that's all that's left. That's it. And decades ago, there would have been more. There would have been more, but that's it. That's all that these, a lot of families yeah. have these days. And yeah. really, the thing I wanted to point out is that um, in times past, back in the golden age, that never, never <laughs> happened. But no, seriously, what actually used to be true is that one child would be buy the house from mom and dad while they were alive. Yes. Yeah. There would be no bank mortgage. There would right. be some kind of... Right. And this was the source mom of... Mom and dad would live in the house. Mom and dad would live in the house. They'd maybe move into a room or maybe whatever living arrangement worked sure. is what they would do. And the child that bought the house would not have a place to live. Their parents would have a place to live. They'd share care and, and well-being for the parents and whatnot as needed. Parents would chip in child care. And um, 
the child gets the house probably at a significant discount for trading hands. I mean, a lot of parents did this for next to nothing. Right. They'd say, oh, I don't know what, Chuck, you know, a buck. Well, it was paid yeah. off. Right, the house was paid off, number one. The parent didn't have a note they had to keep paying. They didn't have a note they needed to keep paying. So, depending on what the family relationship was, was like. There was no balloon mortgage payment, right? too. Right? So, depending on the relationship in the family, um, they would be like a, a token dollar or yeah, something. Sure. And they would the property would change hands right. to one of the children. Right. Or, you know, if they were a different sort of family, right. there'd be some discount off of the market rate right. and they'd get a mortgage or they'd save right. the money or whatever. Right. Give was, that money to the parents and then move in. It was kind of like the way I uh, passed on my car to my brother. Yes. I had only a, I had, I had a three-year car loan mm-hmm. on a, a used car. And I had paid off like two and a half years of it. I had like right. six months or something left six to pay it. Left, right. And I basically said, you know what? You can have it if you just pay off the His remaining payments. Months. Right. So he mm-hmm. got he got a good deal on a car somehow. Right. And you know, and that's and I I couldn't really use it anymore because. I suddenly had a much larger family, family that wouldn't fit in the back of a hunt of a prelude. <laughs> so yeah, so things changed for you. Yeah. And it that was a healthy transaction. Yeah. Here you finish paying it off, the car's yours. Yeah. Have a nice day. And so we did. Right? And it wasn't this about is, trying to get my money back out of no, it. No, no. It, it's it, it wasn't that expensive a car note to begin with. And ideally for these kinds of transactions between family for some and I hesitate to call a car an asset, but assets yeah um it's not supposed to be about the money it's not supposed to it's no. about the asset right and it's about making sure all of yeah. you are solvent no but this this startup now you have basically a startup trying to interject interject into this the profit process into this process into this process of intergenerational wealth transfer right you know because no one has retirement savings anymore right. There's, yeah and and, and yeah, so and Social Security, and if they is really paltry, and so they m- very well may lose the house without mm-hmm. a deal, without a deal like uh, this, some some something like this, right, right, all right. So it's it's sick and perverted. It made, That's what we got now, America. It made me angry. What now, America? Okay, one more, and then a quick intro for the next time. This one is from Current Affairs magazine. Which oh yeah. I think we're going to get a print subscription as soon as as soon as I can spend money on things. Yeah, no this yeah this one kind of made me mad a little bit. Go it on. did, but this is another case where the ideas are interesting within the proposed remedy is maybe head scratching. What wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh this is for actually from uh November 2017. Every parent deserves a nanny state. Ding. I'm looking for the author here. Uh yeah. Vanessa B. There you go. I thought it was Samantha B. For <laughs> yeah. I was like, is this the woman that people are no, talking about? No, no, no. no, no that's Sorry. not. Not the same person. Not, not the same person. Her. Yeah. Um, blah blah blah. I often consider the old adage: "It takes a village to raise a child." The stark reality: growing wealth and income equality has turned the village now a network of low-waged or sometimes unpaid nannies au pairs, tutors, chauffeurs, and other help into an unrecognizable privatized luxury for the rich. Mm. So only the rich gets to afford a village. Right? Yeah. If I were to have a child today, I would find myself in the shoes of most parents in America for whom there is no village, just a nuclear family, if you can hold it together. Echoing, what was it? Uh, d- it's a democracy, if, a republic, if you can you keep it. it. <laughs> yeah, you can keep it. Uh, and an unfair economy in the backdrop. The richest 10% of people have spent the last 40 years hoarding 75% of gains in the U.S. economy. What a bunch of dickheads. For the rest of us, the apex of American capitalism has mostly taken the form of losses. Yeah. Stagnant wages, predatory financialization, eroded labor power and job guarantees, burst housing bubbles, too damn high rents, and a hollowed safety net. Even though Thanks our economy... High. Benefits from population growth. The state continues to confine the cost of care to nuclear families and the private sector. Well, then it wasn't cost anybody else money. Right. Right? So, to borrow the words of uh, 
borrow the words of Nancy Fraser, the democratic socialist and feminist philosopher, our society is facing a crisis of care and it is making American parents absolutely miserable. Seems legit. I think it is. And uh, I had another article I was going to include with this th mm -hmm. that is related, but uh, I don't need to read another article. Um, no. It talks about vacation around the world. Oh. Basically, uh, amounts of paid vacation in industrialized countries. Okay. And right. I, when I read articles like this, I just feel sick at heart because I remember the times that my family was able to take time vacations, away from work yeah. summer vacations we actually traveled we drove across the country my dad had six weeks off every summer uh, and i remember that as important time spent with my family that's why i love road trips yeah and i barely get three weeks now i'm 50 years old um mm -hmm. and even if i do take them um what am i going to do right what, do. <laughs> what am i gonna how am i gonna pay for a, a trip but the real thing the real problem for the last couple of years has been for me like well one of those three weeks was, was spent in the hospital with our baby getting open heart surgery one of them you was know. spent in the hospital having her one of them spent in the hospital having her one of them was spent moving one of them spent moving yeah i and mean we've was, had some kind of situation for years of, for year after year after year for year after year and mm -hmm. it's eaten all our vacation all time. time and so we have no vacation and time. i also change jobs a lot not always willingly mm -hmm. right and when you change jobs you're usually starting at the bottom of the vacation, vacation scale ladder. again yeah. right so 56 kids living here with us that i'd like to do things with yeah three about three weeks total time off, including sick day, sick days and all contingency and everything. Right, and that's generous cons compared to <laughs> compared to many co companies, compared to many but workplaces. It, it just, I am burned out. I really could use a summer vacation. Um, yeah, the kids would love to do a trip with us. They would. They really would. It's not on the horizon for not, this summer. Not no. So, so you know what I've got now. And and one of the reasons I was working from home for those three days mm -hmm. was that I couldn't. If I took three days off, off. that's even less days. Less off. Yeah. It would. If I took those three days, basically the only days I'd have left would be enough to take the few days between Christmas it's and New Year's. Year. Right. And if I so, <laughs> so that would be it. Right. Like be in the office working between Christmas and New Year's for some reason. <sighs> For some, I don't know, guess capitalism told me so. Yeah. But yeah. So um, anyway, she talks a little bit about that, about how so, cultural you know, societies support of children. The greatest predictor of parental happiness is the existence of policies that make it, quote, less stressful and less costly to combine child rearing with paid work. Simply put, European governments help their folks while the United States hands, hangs its own out to dry. So, yep, yeah, do what you can. Good luck with that. Today, most American parents work. Specifically, nearly half of two-parent families include both parents working full-time. Yeah. And only a quarter are supported by a stay-at-home mother. That's yeah. demented. Because, uh, yeah. I mean, I think we're barely holding it together with a stay-at-home stay -home mother. mother. Right. I can't imagine what our lives would look like if I had a full time job. I, it's all your income would go to childcare right. every, every bit, every and probably bit. more of more than and then some of yours. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it would just be ridiculous. In cisgender heterosexual couples, both parents acutely feel the pressure of balancing work and family, but mothers consistently report bearing the brunt of domestic and caregiving duties. Yep. and you know, I, I, I would argue that as fathers and husbands go that i'm more engaged in that kind of domestic work oh yeah than a lot of them no people are frequently shocked to discover you changed diapers <laughs> in 2018 it's like whoa really or or you I'm mentioned like people this, notice that our stovetop is clean it's like wow yours is your stove brand new it's like no i no, my husband paul scrubs it. the stove every three times a week or something. Yeah. But even so, even putting like as much time as I feel that I can into domestic duties, I know that you're still doing more. Yeah. And you know, it's, 
exhausting for me to to be a stay at home dad for a few days. Yeah, it's really but emotionally I, taxing. Yeah, but I will say on those days, mm-hmm. I was also trying to get a full day's work in. <laughs> Right. right. And if with the full day's work remote, it would have been a lot less taxing. Taxing, yes. Right? yes and that's even true. fun. Yeah, it can. Right. Well, the, people are always like, oh, all those kids. I like my job. You like your job. And I, like I, I liked the, the part of like cooking the three meals, right? Yes. Uh, and working with them and playing with them. Yes. I liked that part. I got to do very little of the playing part. Right. Yeah, which is. Always disappointing. Or interacting at all, other than yelling. Like, come on, come on, just pick up your plate. Come uh, on, you can do it. Right. Yeah. So, so I can't. I, I think most dads can't say that they're equal partners with their wives, no matter how yeah. good their intentions. If their wife's a stay-at-home mom, they can't be that equal. Partner. partner. Oh no! I think they're talking about mothers who are working full time and the and, husband's working full time. Yeah, right. Well, they're both working full time, but she still carries the burden of household yeah, yeah, responsibility. Probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. But I just I'm I'm really feeling as the kids get older, acutely feeling. You know, you're talking about women who feel cheated because they didn't get to have as many children as they want. Yeah, I feel cheated already. Mm-hmm. Because I haven't been able to be the kind of parent that I want, right. as far as I want to be, as far as interacting with the kids, teaching them, and doing activities with them, Being with traveling them. with them, taking yeah. vacations with them, taking you know, just showing them stuff. Yeah, uh, because it's like it's always there's always a gun to my head about getting everything done for next Monday morning, you know. Yeah, and or or next work day. The next work day for the next build. For the yeah. Next. Ship date. Skipping ahead, the federal government, also the single largest employer in the nation, leads the way by depriving its two million employees of paid parental leave. Like, why would they do that? They're not there. The private sector, including BMOs like Walmart, follows suit in the treatment of its lower wage workforce. Even in the handful of progressive enclaves in the U.S. where the left has registered wins, the outlook is sobering. Compared to the 45 weeks of leave available to Norwegian mothers, like you can practically send the kid to college after that, right? All right, yeah, they're um, ready to go. New have 45 York's, weeks at home. New York's progressive policy is 12 weeks. Right? Woo! And uh, it's unbelievable how great 12 weeks would be. Right, right. right. And this, just to put that in perspective, yeah. 45, uh, it's 45 weeks. Yeah. Just just shy of a year. Yeah. Yeah. In the struggle for free universal child care, we've actually regressed since World War II. And then mm. she goes on and talks about how there used to be a program. There, yeah, there was know. a program. Yeah. But specifically, now this is the thing I think we need to focus on and comprehend. Yeah. The United States government is only willing to do the minimum necessary to keep you working. Yeah. Yeah. That's their only concern. They want you working. Right. So it, this fits in with the inverted totalitarianism we've yeah. got where companies are in the driver's seat. You know, yeah. For the for profit, everything is in the driver's seat. Policy and, and, is arranged around that. I just need everyone to that. understand that when the state and corporations are functioning as a cohesive unit, yeah. that's fascism. Yeah. Cor- that's what that corporatism, is. Corporatism, fascism, that's inverted all, totalitarianism. That's all it is. That's all that's happening. Yes. And their goal is to keep you working. They have no interest in you raising a family. They just want you working. Right. And other people will show up and they'll keep working until they die so they can eat while they're alive. So I'm not going to so carry on. I'm not going to read the whole article. Um, Thank goodness. There's the issue. There's some more stuff in there. Um, there's the issue of after school and evenings. Uh, that, this is where she kind of starts to lose me. Right, right. And I'll explain it's why. It's her solutions. Go ahead. Yeah, because right. it's the remedies. The like the, the first what her, half. What are her remedies here? What are, the, what are your remedies? Yeah, what do you got in mind? As is made clear by parents' exhausted reports from the second shift, caring for children is no easier after work. And it actually makes me wonder, to some extent, how much she was intending this article to be deliberately provocative, Provocative. devil's advocate kind of. A little bit tongue-in-cheek. Maybe. Right. Um, We rarely think to extend our demands for child care assistance beyond the workday, but there are very sound reasons for doing so. Yeah. 
Though there's a pervasive social assumption that 100% DIY parenting <laughs> is inherently more going. virtuous, the truth is that parents, as a class, are not innately better suited than experienced caregivers when it comes to performing emotionally rewarding but ultimately mundane child care related tasks like homework, cooking dinner, and tucking children in. This is where I think she may be like joking. She, I, think, I, I, I hope she's joking, but carry on. One percent families have no qualms enlisting the private village to help their children with common core style math and building science projects. They're also psychopaths, okay? Yeah, well let's just be honest about this, okay? There is that little problem. I mean I I'm not looking to them for moral guidance or no. for parenting no. advice. No. In fact, rich parents are the few people in the US who are able to take advantage of of the ultimate outsourcing village, remember this idea that the wealthy have access this to a village, village right. the boarding school. Please. Now, I had to, before you jump to on her too much, I just want to point out you and I have talked about sending our kids to boarding school. We've reflected on the on the idea, and I do know kids now who, as adults, spent years in boarding school, especially in high school. In high school, right? She's talking about eight year olds. Yes, I know, but and and by all accounts had a great time. You know, and I here's the thing. I know that in traditional culture, it's very 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 common that children leave home. Mm. Yeah, in their early teens. Yeah. It's very common and are given when they start to smell bad. And given adult <laughs> responsibilities. Yes. Right? And given an adult uh not exactly status, but right. but this actually in a lot of very traditional cultures you have adult status in your early teens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not really parsing this idea. And we have talked about sending our kids to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And that's been on the table and an opportunity we considered seriously. Yeah. I mean, we're not considering it now, but we're looking at, okay, so when again, when we might have savings and money well, again. <laughs> well, and, and specifically, there's a, there's a few boarding schools I think would be very good for our boys. Yeah. But... Um, all that aside, that we reflected on that as a possibility and maybe of having value. Right. Um, I'm. What's the word I'm looking for? This idea that because the rich have it and do it, it is therefore a good thing. That's that that's seems a perverse. Fallacy. That's a fallacy, I, and it seems perverse. I want. I wonder if it, perverse. I should look into whether that fallacy has a name. I yeah. feel like it does. It probably does. Right? I, like, when oh, you the look rich are into, doing it, therefore... When you look into, like, all the Latin-named fallacies and everything, you discover that they, all these thoughts have been thought before. Everyone, everyone's already thought about it. Right. So that's that seems like a dangerous place to go as policy. Yeah. I, I'm In the American context, I'm not opposed to any parent choosing what they need to do with their children's education. Yeah. Like at all. And really like shaking it up. So Do what you got to do. But she is talking about a public boarding school. Yeah. So, so when I was growing up in France, my mother took a job as a caregiver in a home for people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. This was just a few years after my parents divorced in the mid-90s. The two of us decamped from a sleepy village outside the city of Lyon to a cheaper unit in the city. Our new home in the projects of the Duchère neighborhood was rougher. Concerned about my ability to adjust... I was, in her words, an easily influenced child. Hmm. My mother enrolled me in the Internat Adolphe Favre in the hilly Croix-Rousse quarter. Mm -hmm. Formerly a boarding school, the public institution paid for by the city now sent its attendees to the local elementary and high school. Like most parents who sent their children there, my mother paid an insignif insignificant fee from ages 8 to 10... My mother dropped me off on Sunday nights and picked me up on Friday evenings. Our parents remained responsible for school-related meetings and could call us during phone hours in the evenings. We were cared for by educators, fed by chefs at dinner, and at night we were watched by guards we knew on a first-name basis. We slept in loft beds with our own, ver our very own desks at the bottom. If we finished our homework early, we played soccer in the field outside, screamed at each other over foosball on the second floor, or hid out to read. 
we shared secrets and blanket forts and occasionally lice. <laughs> Good times. And frankly, she's describing what is a, a, a fantasy for many children of like the Harry Potter world. Yeah. Right. She's describing that fantasy. Meanwhile, our parents had the space to get their shit together, knowing we were safe and happy. For my mother, this meant being able to work nights to support us, to sleep soundly when she got home, and even to have a hint of a social life as a single mother. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think what she and her family did was wrong. I think this is poor policy. But carry on. So she does not say uh, this is like, as you might imagine, some... People in the socialist democracies, Norway, whatnot, places like that, would say this is just how it should be done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she says individual personalities and circumstances will differ and sometimes evolve even within the same family. Boarding school will not be the best fit for every parent and child, nor should it be. Boarding school should be about expanding options to parents and reimagining our childbearing culture, child rearing culture. Yeah, I don't know too much about the reimagining. But then she, she does talk about some other things that could help, some other remedies. Yeah, other remedies. Let's hear it. Uh, carving out more time to care for children and for oneself can be achieved by additional means, too, or different means, I would say. <laughs> Luckily for us, some of these means complement existing goals of the left. Mm -hmm. For instance, shortening the work week to 36 or even 30 hours. Huzzah. I'm right there. I, I can't even. So having worked at various jobs um, over the years, sometimes as many as 90 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, crazy, crazy hours. Mm -hmm. I will say that I actually have kind of discovered by accident mm -hmm. that I am most productive as far as getting an enormous amount of code written during business hours, working six hours a day. Yes. And... The rest of the time really is inevitably, despite your best intentions or whatnot, filler. Uh, padded, padded, padding. Filler. And I think even five would do it, right? Yeah, yeah, five would do and it. And if you have a short day like that, you basically come in ready to work. Yeah. You get down, you pick up your project, you work on it. You work pretty much continuously in a block. Mm -hmm. I would only say six hours a day if you had paid lunch. Okay, five. Yeah. Because cause you're actually five, good. right, right, and then you go home. You go home, and you actually come back rested and interested in what you're doing. You're and not, you're yeah. not, chronic, chronically burning yourself out. Right, you're not quite so thirsty for vacation. And let's say it's a factory job. Yeah, that means you can have more shifts and more people can work. More people. Right. Yeah, I, it's to me, it's it's a bit of a no brainer. You know. I mean, if we're going to do this thing, yeah. if we're going to do the capitalist thing, okay, that's because cool. a lot of people who work in office jobs like me, engineering jobs or whatnot, mm -hmm. it's just sort of a given that you're not productive all day, despite your best intents. Yeah, yeah. Humans, and especially if you don't have get your vacation in, yeah, right. There's this sort of progressive burnout right. that happens. Well, you're really just not as effective as you could be over time, right? And yeah, I, I yeah. really do think a shorter work week would and so go a long way. Would go a long way, and so that's a solution that I advocate. You know, uh, I think that you know the time. Yeah, with no, the if kids. we're not going to burn it down straight up, right? For many of okay, so in the Netherlands, which already works one of the shortest work, shortest weeks in the EU, the government actually encourages parents to take more time off during the week. For many, this day or half day has become. Yeah, or a half day every week, right? Right. Has become kinder dog or kids' mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Imagine a state where taking weekly family leave. Like, go take care of your family. Was not only possible but encouraged, and where, depending on the family's wealth, parents who opted to work a shorter week would be entitled to compensation to balance their reduced hours. Mm -hmm. So you're doing this and you're not losing money. Yes, it doesn't cost you to do this, right? Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. People are like, well... How are you going to pay for that? People are, who are, they believe that if you have a family, you're inevitably less focused on your work and that mm. makes your work worse. Well, they think that about women. 
is thinking about women, but they're thinking about men too. Is that new? Is that is that really happening? I think it's just creeping. <laughs> okay, yeah. But um, I see it a little differently. Yeah. I see it at the you know dizzying age of fifty, right? Mm-hmm. And having had a family for a while, I see it as people who have families now have some perspective. Oh yeah, yeah. In order to actually be able to pick and choose what's important in their work and obsess less on busy work. On busy work and details. And yeah. Showing up smiling at 8 a.m. Yeah. Well, that's not going to happen. Anyway, but, you know, so we can talk about remedies and you're not in favor of universal, you're not in favor of mandated boarding school or universal public education that's mandated because we homeschool. Yeah, yeah I'm not, and, and, I want to be very clear about this. In a lot of socialist countries, homeschooling is illegal. It's illegal. It's straight up illegal. Yeah. And I don't know. I think if I was a native Finn, I might be okay with it. You might feel, well, you might have been so impressed and happy with the school system that you'd be like, yeah, sure, just take them. (laughs) Just take them. Let's do this. I'll see them on weekends. (laughs) Right. You know, and they might be happy about it. Maybe. 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 Um, but, I'm not their bullshit tantrums be somebody else's, right? right. But, um, but no, 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 no. I think I don't think that even happen. What do you mean? In a different context, they wouldn't have the bullshit tantrums, right? Yeah, it yeah. wouldn't even happen in a different context, right. right? But the um, um, uh, the Nordic system, the Nordic Nordic uh, states, yeah, Germany, a little bit in France, but a lot of these um, Western European quasi socialist states. Yeah. Um homeschooling is illegal. Private schools are illegal. Yep. And specifically Finland which has such great outcomes that we talk about. Mm-hmm. Um private schools illegal. The only see, school I, system see, I agree with that. <laughs> the only school system is the public school system. Yeah. And everybody everybody uses it. Yeah. No matter how rich, no matter how poor, everybody uses the school system. And that's why it's good. And that's why it's good. Yeah, exactly. Because they understand that they're educating the wealthiest people in society. Yeah. And the poor people happen to give along, come along for the ride. Right. So that's why it's a good public system. Right. And I I mean, one, here's one thing, for example, just <laughs> blow a few minds. Anybody in the disability community yes. who's ready to have their mind blown, keep listening. Yeah. There are no special ed classrooms in Finland. All children are mainstreamed from day one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, mind you, this is also the context where there's a strong incentive to actually um, to kill disabled children before they're born. <laughs> but I'll leave that for another day. Yeah, that's another show. <laughs> but if one happens to make it through the gate <clears throat> right. and now has human rights that we're bound to respect, right. we don't kill them anymore. Right. If we can get away with it. And they're they're completely included in the classroom as full peers. Right. And support it. And support it. And Whatever the, their needs the, might be, the classes. Teachers are actually trained, trained well enough and competent to, deal with to manage disabilities. a classroom that includes children with disabilities. Yeah. Of, of a variety of kinds, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, et cetera. Right. Whatever I, the impairment might be. I think your worry and I'm kinda of with you is that with anything that starts to resemble like a mandated boarding school arrangement, like you, it basically <laughs> starts to look like the Indian you know, schools, round and round. Yeah, you know, the Indian schools, or just like state mandated in, indoctrination camp, or yeah. you know, or a work camp, a work or, camp. You know. And it just it starts to seem a little creepy. It and, really, it really, it really seems creepy. Yeah, creeps me the yeah. hell out. And you know, it's great for the kids so. who are sort of like. Those kids that are like in the median, those yeah. sort of aggressively yeah. normal kids. Right. Hey, that's right. great. Go right. have a good time. Right. But if you're a little weird, it's gonna get it's weird. It's gonna hurt you. It's gonna hurt you. I it's gonna be so. weird. Yeah. And I know a number of a number of parents that I know in, in the disability community. Well, they've at the end at their wits' end send yeah. their children to the boarding school because they just can't manage their care. They can't manage right. their behaviors right. anymore. And have their children horrifically abused. Yeah. yeah. Because these trained professional caregivers yeah. I don't, are just people like you and me. I don't really buy her sort of... Pollyanna? Beauty, Pollyannish vision of the quality of the care that the kids would get in a publicly run, publicly funded boarding school. 
in the United but, States. But well, that's that's the thing. Maybe it would work better in a semi-socialist or more socialist country. It, maybe. But here, you know that that public school is half privatized, and yeah. everything about the the maintenance, the security, the the food, the this, the that the, is outsourced. It's outsourced, and if you want to see an example, just look at a look at a local prison. Yeah, I'm and, sorry. It's... Well, or even your the other local prison, the public school. The public school, right? Right. And the quality of the food, the quality. A lot of public schools don't have windows anymore. The building maintenance. They so we were t- to just to do a quick callback. Those days last week. After Memorial Day, mm-hmm. the next couple of days, the Detroit public schools were closed for half days because the school buildings don't have air conditioning Just either. And it wasn't safe to have children inside. No. All this, day. This is, you know, May. Right? And it's May. Well, I guess it was, yeah, it was, it was still May. May. Yeah. Last so, couple of days of May. but So really, the idea that this would, like, work here... On a, pu- on a public uh, level, it's, it's just, pretty dubious. It's it's dubious. Yeah. It's really dubious. Um, yeah. I, I just I don't see it. Yeah. So it, I'm just going to give her the last word here. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the truth is that American parents across all economic classes deserve better help during the workday and outside working hours. Yeah, I agree with that. A nanny yeah. state would go a long way towards giving us all a chance to be happier. Uh, state that's, go to hell. That, that's, smash the state. Anyway, I, I do, I do see some, some state remedies, some state supports for, sure. for what ails us, but it, it doesn't involve just, uh, just expanding them off. what we've got now. Right. All right. Well, no, the, like the other thing that I see Everyone's talking about it like it's an educational goal and how much this will benefit children. Yeah. That's horse shit. Whenever yeah. you hear people talking about universal preschool, right. universal mandated preschool, as in you're breaking the law if your three-year-old doesn't show up at 8.30 in the morning. Right, right. That's horse shit. They yeah. want you at work. Yeah, yeah. And you're screwing around taking care of your baby. The fuck's what wrong a, with you? You waste. need to be at work. Yeah. So... The they're state gonna, will pick up the tab. Take your benefits away. Right, we'll take your benefits away, and you can send your baby to school because you want your baby to succeed, right? <sighs> All right, and you can I'm, come to work. I'm going to introduce, yeah, a topic for uh, maybe our next show, maybe a show a little further into the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is an article from Viewpoint Magazine. It's a review of Melinda Cooper's book, Family Values Between Neoliberalism and new social conservatism. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have to order a copy of this book. Yeah, it's looking pretty tasty. We're still, our books are piling up. We're not reviewing them. Um, Yeah. Anyway. Now we have this book situation. We've got to get it under control. Yeah. But, um, you know, here's the only kind of thing that I I fear Mm -hmm. is if this is um, Melinda Cooper writing informally, then her book's right. going to be impenetrable, you know, oh, in the scholarly yeah, jargon level. So yeah, we'll see. It, it may be, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to read a bit to give you a taste of it, and then I, I think we're actually going to wind up. Yeah, yeah. But no, I think we want to talk about this one. We do. The Fordist family wage, which assigned white unionized men the waged role in productive labor and white women an unpaid role as domestic workers in the household, was a defining component of the Fordist division of labor. Do you feel like you want to, you can explain Fordism? I think I know what it is, and it's certainly referenced in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, right? Right. Um, They're talking about Henry Ford's vision of, yeah. of, of um, uh, capitalism. Factory like way, labor. Factory labor and the way it would work. It also centered around assembly line work. Yes. Where you had an assembly line at work, and you would assemble that at, at home. home. Yes. Right. Yes. And that, you know, if these things are in order, you produce more. Right. Right? right. You produce more, you produce better, and you do it at lower cost. And you're also contributing to the GDP. The GDP. You know. Right. So it's good for everybody in every way. Yeah. Ding. TM. 
This is the compact that brought many unionized working men and their families into an expanded middle class. Mm-hmm. This is the post-war boom, basically. Post-war boom. And, it, and mind <clears throat> you, this is actually where the shift from class as like the reality of class yeah. to like this sort of bullshit socioeconomic, like how much money you make. Right. Right. Rising wages for one class of workers, white men, was possible on condition that another class of workers was not paid, white women. For a long time, African-American men were excluded from this compact altogether, and African-American women, like the poorest of white women, were still expected to work outside the home. And raise children. Often performing domestic work in the home of others. Right. Yeah. And somehow raise, raise their, own, children their own families. Right. right. The New Deal welfare state was never meant to extend beyond the core of white male unionized workers. That's my problem with the New Deal. Yeah. 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 So this book is, uh, just judging from this interview, this book is extremely provocative. Yeah. And it pushes all the current buttons, right? I mean, <laughs> yes. it's intersectional. Oh, it's yeah. all this, you know, every sort of trend in leftist thought seems like it's represented here. Hit this up, yeah. And... So I am fascinated to read this book. I'm just afraid that it, it, if she writes more formally than she speaks, or in this interview, it's going to be really jargon-heavy. Jargon-heavy and just sort of dry to move through. Yeah. And I'm not sure, you know, if she doesn't like unpack some of the terminology, it's going to be, I, I don't know that we'll, well be she, able to rent, uh, to um, it recommend to, it to, right, to our listeners. To a general audience. Right. No, and so she, so she, throw out, she throws out Fordism without like unpacking it? Yeah, no. She does. Like, yeah. Here it is. Yeah. You know what I, I'm talking about. But she talks a lot about it. Okay, it's just, in this interview, the interview is fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. And it gets into a lot of things, and I just, I don't want to try and unpack it all here tonight. Now. But People like Milton Friedman and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who had been actively involved in Nixon's project to extend the family wage, began to question the whole purpose of the welfare state. They were not interested in supporting a welfare state that now extended to non-normative lifestyle choices. Right. Women who had never been married. Women who had no legal attachment to a husband, who may have been in a relationship with a man or woman, but were accessing welfare on an independent basis. Mm Mm-hmm. So it ties together like these cultural shifts. Um, oh yeah, I mean with these TANF replaced. Shifts. Let's let's remember that yeah. TANF replaced ADFC, aid or AFDC, yeah. aid to families with dependent children. Right. It was right. named that on purpose because it was for it was families. For families and with nuclear, dependent children, nuclear families. Right. Yeah, white nuclear families, really. But yeah, and when you frame it as being for black families then support for it plummets Plummets. and it's it's, what we're not doing that easily dismantleable yes or targetable yes and that's clintonism but mind you mind you in 1989 working class white women would say to me with a straight face if you need to stay home to take care of your children you take the welfare and you take care of your children yeah yeah i mean this this wasn't a million years ago we're not talking about the 30s no you know, this was well, this was like a but, an or a norm. Yeah, but in understanding how the well, world was supposed that, to work, that was in liberal working class, liberal white women were were saying that, right? No, this this was a pretty conservative uh, working class white woman. Okay, I mean, and that was and that was the message I got from a lot of okay. working class it's not, white women. It's not the message that anyone who was a Ronald Reagan fan was espousing because his his dog whistles were all about oh i i think he this is the thing i think people don't understand about reagan yeah okay so so 45 is a response to what's here yeah reagan set the stage for that yeah sure like so reagan shifted those beliefs yes um there were things that were shifting in the democratic party to lose some of their white working class space yeah and uh, Republicans kind of like said, "Hey, what about over here? Yeah. Over here, guys." Yeah. And yeah. then, yeah, and the, then, once they the got them was... under the tent, once they got them into the tent, yeah. they said, "Okay, guys, these are this is how it works," mm-hmm. and started molding and shaping their opinion. Remember, in 1989 is pre Fox News. That's true. So once that That's moved into true. place, that started to really reshape people's yeah. personal views. Yeah. So um, 
there was a small there's always been this small core of folks who are, are white nationalists in yeah. the United States yeah. they, they, they've always been here they're not new they didn't go away right. including right. Daniel Patrick Morning, <laughs> for example <laughs> But at the same time, so that small core kind of flocked over right away yeah. in response to the, do- the dog whistles. Yeah. And it's large enough to tip an election. Yeah. Okay. That's the important piece of information. Okay. But the bulk of these the sort big, of... The, the large, the sort long of tail... Reagan Democrats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bulk of those Reagan Democrats w- were like, huh, that's a little weird you would say that about welfare. Right. They're like, they're kind of uncomfortable that, with that. Right. And oh, it, it wasn't... It took longer to... Right. So 10 or 12 years later, they were parroting that themselves. But what they actually thought were New Deal values. Yeah. That that's how families worked. And this was your responsibility as a parent. Yeah. Was to be home with your kids. Then she talks, oh, she gets into uh, neoliberalism a lot. And it's pretty fascinating. Her analysis yeah. is pretty fascinating. Neoliberalists had a more minimalist understanding of family responsibility. For minimalist, them, yeah. family responsibility meant that the yeah. family or the couple should be the primary source of economic security and in this way function as a substitute to the welfare state. Mm, minimalist, they, I like were, that. they were in general much less normative about the particular form of these relationships. Doesn't matter. Didn't have to, like they were willing to accept non nuclear families arrangements. Right. Uh, I detail in my analysis of the neoliberal response to the AIDS crisis were some of the first advocates of same-sex marriage, which they understood, this is interesting, as a kind of mutual insurance contract, right? Yes. Oh, we support that because then, you know... They'll support us. We won't have to pay for them. We won't have to pay for that. Right. They'll right. support each other. Right. Um, alternative kinship relations were not a problem for them, as long as these relationships could successfully internalize the health and welfare costs of partners and children. Right. Right. As long as they didn't, their tax dollars didn't have to pay for anything they needed. Right. That's cool. Skip down a bit. Uh, they were variously in favor of decriminalize, decriminalizing prostitution, sodomy, mm-hmm. and recreational drugs. Uh, Foucault misses the big proviso that goes along with all this. All social costs, the cost of raising children, the economic fallout from divorce, health care costs, STIs, need to be internalized by the parties to the sexual contract. Kinship, relation, marriage, and parenthood are legal means through which the state can enforce these costs. Right. So that's a, an interesting take on neoliberalism. Yeah. And I I really want to read more about this. Yeah, no, I, I need this so, one. This needs yeah. to be on the docket. Yeah. So I'm looking, is there enough, a third good quote? Third nugget? What you see in the alt-right is the expression of a white masculine libertarianism that wants to free itself from all imagined statist, feminine, and maternal moral prohibitions. Yeah. That that has to sink in. That needs to be unpacked a little bit, right? No, that's the shit. When I read that, I was like, yeah. yeah. The left yeah. being associated with infantilization, while at the same time pursuing a relentless campaign of moral vigilantism against women. Yes. That's that's everything. <laughs> right? yeah. That's like, she's, she's got it, man. Right. The libertarian and puritanical impulses are not incompatible. It's a, mil- it's a familiar feature of misogyny, libertarianism for men and purity for women. Right. It's also a familiar feature of historical fascist movements. And I, I have done a little reading on this. Um, I've se- There are... Uh, old German texts from the fascist era that translated, like, unpacked to a lot of this Jordan Peterson bullshit today, you All know. That. It's really creepy, honestly. All that's right and there. And every weird detail about, like, the natural state of women, the, you know, you're seeing it now on Twitter every day in yeah. these incel rants and whatnot. And it's... That's really strange that those guys never get blocked. <laughs> That's weird. Don't yeah, they don't have their accounts shut down. That's so weird. I think, so I, I've hypothesized before that I have kind of some kind of a soft ban. Uh, a shadow ban on Twitter. A shadow ban on Twitter. Mm-hmm. But just today, like, I had like three new people follow me, so I think it may have been, something may have changed. Are they incels? No. Okay. Um, but I haven't had a new follower for like... Months. Months and months. So... Oh, maybe, the, oh, maybe Twitter heard us. <laughs> maybe they were listening to the Twitter? NSA tapes. Are you listening now? Tweet once if you can hear the sound of my voice. Twice if you can't. <laughs> anyway, 
I think we're going to have to wind up. It's probably a good note right there. But we do want to dig into this. Melinda Cooper, family values between neoliberalism and new social uh, conservatism. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to get that book. Jesus. Yeah. So what do you mean? Do you mean like a credit card just for books? Well, that was kind of what I imagined my black card being for. Oh, the credit card just for books. Okay. Yeah. But um, it's, now we've had all this travel and everything. do what you got to do. Anyway. We're going to wind up, and I've got to edit this, and then we've got to a get new to work sleep week. and start a whole new work week again. So, Sayonara. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. We would love some comments. We're so happy to have people listening. Yeah. And um, I'm... Again, we apologize for missing a whole week. Not only did we miss a week, but we've been gone for like 10 or 11 days because we were we had to do a show no. early before right. you left. So right. it's been... It's been like three weeks. Yeah. Still be posted. Yeah. So right. I hope um, you guys almost. are all still there. Yeah. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.